have come as a people, as a church, as individuals to say, we have seen your goodness in our life. And we are here to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Please take your seat. Uh, once again, you are welcome to church this morning. So this morning, I just quickly want to tidy up what we started on Sunday as God put it in my spirit to share with us on the concept of generosity. So today, I would speak in that light on the how I ended last week, which is structured generosity. Structured generosity. Structured generosity. Uh, but before I get into the details of that, I just want to show us through the word of God what is supposed to be the mindset of someone who is generous. The mindset of a generous person. And I'd like us to read the book of First Chronicles, chapter 29, from verse 12 to 14. Let it be said of us at Victory Chapel that we are a generous people. Let it be known by all that we are a generous people. Let it become our lifestyle. Let it become our approach to life. And this is anchored on the word of God. That is what the word of God does. It continues to shape us, shape our values, shape our behavior. Uh, this is uh, the man called Solomon. After he had um, offered multitudes of sacrifice unto God. And here is what he said. He said, both riches and honor comes from you. And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand is it to make great and to give strength to all. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise you for your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people? That we should be able to offer so willingly. So he offered. And instead of him to sit back and expect an accolade for his giving. He was still thankful for the opportunity to give. That we should be able to offer so willingly as these. For all things in themselves comes from you. And for your own, we have given you. And of your own, we have given you. So we can see the disposition of, in the entire scripture, the man that was regarded as the wealthiest man that ever lived. As the wisest man that ever lived in the Bible times. And he offered unto the Lord a thousand burnt offering, which no man has ever done. And when he was responding to that, he said, I acknowledge, first of all, that everything we have comes from God. So that is the first mindset of a generous person. That everything that I have actually comes from God. Whether you are into oil and gas, whether you are into trade, Everything that is bringing you revenue was part of what God created in the first instance. So if God did not make them available, you can't even turn them to wealth or to treasures in your hand. So a, a, a generous person believes that everything you have comes from God. Everything you have was given to you. Everything you have was given to you. Number two, from that same scripture, a generous person believes that everything both in heaven and on earth belongs to God. He owns everything, including you. He owns everything. There is a song that my father loves to sing. If the song says, It's got the whole world in it. 
his hands. David set the cattle on the thousand eels. They are yours. And someone buttressed that point and he even said, the eels on which the cattle are also do what? Also does what? Belongs to him. So everything, the Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and its fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's and his fullness thereof. That was where we heard of the story of a, of a rich, wealthy man in the scripture. The Bible said he looked at his harvest that year and said, wow, see hard work. See my commitment. See how much I've put in. See my wisdom. You know, I used to tell people, people are not smart in the management of their finances. That's why they are broke. See how I've been able to manage. I have business acumen. And he said all of that. And he said, this is what I'm going to even do is that this, my reservoir is too small. This, my bank account is too small. I'm going to pull it down and open a bigger account and open a bigger store to be able to contain all that I have. And oh boy, just continue to live your life and enjoy your life. And there was no argument from heaven. But that night, God came to ask for his life. Because even your life belongs to me. That's all. Everything just finished. He was boasting of all that he had. But the owner said, no, it's not like that. So a wise, wealthy man will understand that you are just a steward of God's resources. You are just what? A steward of God's resources. Everything in heaven and on earth belongs to him. And no man receives anything except it is given to them of the Lord. No man. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. The Bible even says there, it is God who even gives you the power to make wealth. It is he who empowers you with the wisdom, with the skill, with the connection, with the network, with the raw material, with the capital. Everything you needed to have made profit in life. It is he. And he did that to establish his covenant. The fourth thing that a generous man understand, I mean the next thing rather, is that you can't meet everyone's need. So you can't replace God even in your generosity. You can't meet everyone's need. You are not their source, rather a channel of God's blessing to people. So you know, even when people are coming to you, you don't stand in a place of arrogance, assuming the posture of the source of their life. So a generous man won't say things like, if not for me, even though God used you. But you can never point, come to a point where you boast and say, if not for me, you will not be there. Because you understand that if not you, God will have still raised somebody else. And that need will have been met. So you will never come to a point and say, if not me, if not me, your life, if not me. That does not also mean on the other hand, if God had used somebody for you, you would have, you would have happened and say, if it did not be God, would have used somebody else. That also is arrogant on the receiver's end. So at least the person yielded to be used, appreciate it. But on the part of the giver, you don't come to a point where you begin to brag and say, if not for me, you will not be where you are. Once you make that statement, you have arrogated the office of God to yourself. And that is pride and rebellion in his instance. And the Bible says, God resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. So he's like saying, I'm God, I'm the source. So you know, you are not their source. You know, I met one man, quite a wealthy man. And when he gives people things, uh, people come and tell him, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And he taught us something. He said, God, I don't, that before in Christianity, if you tell somebody thank you, what is your response? Ah, thank God, or we thank God. Because you are, you are quickly smart enough to return the praise to God. But you know, English language taught us differently. So they corrected us those days and said, no, if somebody says thank you, collect it, just say you are welcome. You are welcome. 
before we say thank you don't mention thank God we thank God but that's, that's Christianly but you know the word makes you feel like it's not touch enough you know, say thank you sir someone say you are welcome you are welcome mention <laughs> mention again re-mention it but the man said no, that's not the disposition he said, he said oh we thank God because God blessed me with it that I may bless you with it so ultimately the praise goes to God and that is the next thing that a generous person understands now let me show you in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 11 very profound truth Second Corinthians, rather, chapter 9 and verse 11. Second Corinthians. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality. So, the reason you are enriched is for what? Liberality. He said, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. So a generous person understand that your generosity causes thanksgiving to ascend to God. That's actually what God gains from your generosity. Is what? Thanksgiving. Have you ever received help from someone and you go back to your room and you didn't you don't even know where to start from. You just say, thank God. Ah, God, I thank you. Because in you, you know, this is truly the hand of God. God had used this person, but no. It couldn't have been this person. Imagine an uncle of yours that have forgotten about you. Suddenly wakes up at a point in your life that you are desperately in need. And even if you were to make a call, you would not have reached to him. Because he's not even in talking terms with your father who is his brother. And he calls you out of the blues and says, how are you? How is school? I heard you are now in 300 level. Tell me your account number. And he sends you the amount that you need desperately. You will know he's not about my uncle. This is God. So I've seen many of you come to church on a Sunday to thank God for a miraculous supply during the week. That rejoicing and thanksgiving that goes to God is what a generous person understands. And he wants more of that to ascend to heaven through him. He wants more people to be given God praise. And I'm telling you, this is one of the secrets. I told you last week. This is one of the secrets of billionaires all over the world. They have a fraction of their wealth committed to generosity. In fact, as I preach it on Sunday, during the week, you know, the way God does is that, uh, and I teach something, I see it on the street again during the week to buttress what, I, what, I, what God put in my spirit. So I saw two, two videos that challenged me. One was not a video, the other was a write-up. I've, I'm trying to research how true it is, but I've, the author that wrote it, I believe that is a true source. And he was talking about Dan Gote and says that every day, if I'm not wrong with the number, that Dan Gote buys bread up to whether 2 million or many millionaire of bread every day to be distributed to the poor people in his state. Every day. Millions of naira just to buy. In fact, they call it dangote bread. Every poor man on the street is expecting the bread. That runs into billions of naira every year. And they said he has been doing it for years. That is different from the money under dangote foundation. That is just bread for the poor. So when those poor beggars eat that bread, who do you think they thank? Somewhere in their mind, they thank God for, they will say, I pray over that food. I say, Father, we thank you for this food. We bless you for this food. It is ascending to God. A generous person knows that. And he wants more fragrance of thanksgiving to ascend to God on his behalf. That was the same thing that happened to Cornelius. When the Bible said, Cornelius, who was an unbeliever, God spoke concerning him and said, your alms giving has come up to God as a memorial. The man himself is not yet in right standing with God because he has not been sanctified and washed by the blood of Jesus. But his alms giving is already making records. 
in heaven. And these people know it. They know it. Because God wants to supply the need of all mankind. And he passes that resources through people. It is God does not think the way we think. We will think only good people should have good life. And bad people should not have a good life. God does not behave like that. The Bible says God causes both the rain and the sun to come on both the righteous and the unrighteous. So the son and daughters of those wicked people, God still wants to cater for them. And sometimes some of us shut our bowels of mercy. But God has a way. And when anybody positioned himself in that line of generosity, in meeting those people's need, thanksgiving goes to God, and God is delighted. God even cuts it a sacrifice that is well pleasing to him. Another thing that a generous person knows is that it is a great privilege to meet other people's need. It is a great privilege to meet other people's need. Another thing that they know is that their giving helps them to store up treasures in heaven. Luke chapter 12 thing verse 33 the Bible says you should not put your treasure where moth and worms will eat it up. But lay up your treasures in heaven. And that scripture was buttressing Jesus' teaching on generosity. On giving to the poor. On giving to those who are in need. Another key point that generous people know is that generosity is not a function of abundance. But a function of a generous heart. Generosity is not a function of abundance. It's not because it's not people give not because they have so much. That is why many people are not giving. They just feel that giving is meant for the very extremely wealthy people. No, but generous people understand that no matter the financial level that I find myself, no matter the social class that I belong to, I can be generous. So it's not a function. This is what I'm telling you. You should have experienced it by now. Maybe that is somebody that you know that is very, very wealthy. And that is somebody that I've, I've experienced it several times. And when I'm thinking, oh, this thing, ah, this person will give you this kind of, ah, this person has money now. But the person that you did not even imagine that has so much resources, they give so much and sometimes I begin to wonder, how? Where? Where did you see this kind of resources? And sometimes they have done it out of the entirety of what they have. Jesus went to the temple and he sat down observing those that were giving offerings in church. And there was a widow. And people were giving big, huge offerings. Jesus didn't make any remark. And there was a widow. The Bible says the widow gave two mites. That is where we got the famous widow's mite. When people use the word widow's mite, it's not in widow's mite about them. Because widow's mite was the last card of the widow. But you, you gave 1,000 out of 50,000 and you call it widow's mite. It isn't widow's mite. There is nothing widow about it. And there is nothing might about it. So that woman gave, and Jesus said, This woman who has given these two mites has given the best, has given the most. They said, Why? He said, Because he, she gave all that she had. She gave all that she had. The widow of Zarephath gave all that was left for her and her child to eat and die. That was all. Peter had only one boat and that was what he gave. He didn't have a spare at home. He gave all. Simon of Cyrene, who gave his grave, I believe, for Jesus to be buried, had just one tomb. 
Just one. He didn't build two. He just had one and he relegated that one and said, Jesus, you can use it. So this is the mindset of generous people. Let me show you something in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. So I begin to share the structures of your giving. 1 Timothy chapter 6, from verse 17. From verse 17. Command, this was Paul admonishing Timothy to teach what I'm teaching in his church. So it is an apostle's doctrine that must be taught. And what did he say? He said, command those who are rich. The tone of teaching should not even be of suggestive idea where if you like, you can do. He said, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to be high-minded, not to be boastful, not to be proud, not to look down on other people. I told you the story before of a man who had a son and he goes to the shop to buy expensive shoe for his boy. Designer wears. And then this guy went to either school or church and saw a friend, a colleague of his, wearing, you know, all these rubber sandals. And him, he used to wear correct leather sandals. The father had money and he used to buy. And this boy saw the friend and mocked at the friend. And said, Daddy, imagine him. <laughs> rubber. The father went to the market and bought two of that rubber and collected every other leather and said, this rubber is what you are wearing. One spoil, enter the other one. Because he was teaching that child a lesson that because you are advantaged does not mean you should look down on the disadvantaged. Some rich people are not just looking down on the disadvantaged. They are doing everything possible to push more people down in the disadvantaged level. So that the advantage can be more conspicuous. You know, if you wear a particular dress to church and everybody is wearing, you don't feel good. But you want to wear something that nobody can reach to. So the push, every said, one them. They should not trust in uncertain riches. They should not put their confidence in that money. They should not put their trust in that riches. No, it is just passing through your hands. There's a man in Nigeria, very one of the foremost billionaires in Nigeria. I don't want to mention his name. He was so rich that if you need to withdraw, if you need to give you money, he does not need a check. He can put his signature on tissue paper and he will take you to bank and they will give you money. Because there is no amount of money they give you that will affect his money. He can sign in tissue paper and say, take it, they will attend to you in those days. He was so wealthy that he said that even if devourers enter his money, that the devourer will chop the money and die in the money. It's not his money that will finish, but the devourer will finish. The man died, and we don't know the direction of the wealth again in the world. He died untimely, and that was the end. There is nothing on earth today, an enterprise that is named again after him. The government just tried to name certain institutions after him, but it's not about that he started a business and the business is still thriving till today. I'm not sure there is one. His children are alive, oh. plenty of them. But the wealth just fizzled. No wonder the Bible says, Who is he that gathereth much more than he needs? He said he still tends to poverty. Wrong, continue with me. Who gives richly to all to enjoy? Yes. Let them do good. This is one way you will not be haughty. This is one way you will not be high-minded. Let them consistently do good. That they may be rich in good works. You, if you are rich in cash and you are not rich in good works, you are not rich unto God. 
we should come to a point that the measure of how wealthy a man is is supposed to be by the measure of his distribution, not his acquisition. So when we are rating wealthy people, it's not supposed to be measured by how many houses they have built and they are living in, but how many people they have provided accommodation for. It's not how many courses they eat in one meal, but how many people can have at least a meal because of them. That is the true measure in the sight of God for generosity. They must be ready to give, willing to share. Next. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So that they can store up for themselves treasures in the place where moth and caterpillar cannot destroy So what am I saying today? I want to bring you to the close of my message, which is how to structure your generosity. Last week, I laid two solid foundations, which is number one, you must decide how much of your income, how many many percentage of whatever comes into your hand will you commit to distribution to other people and to other causes. You must settle that before the money comes. You must settle that now that you are young. You must settle that now. It is a principle that you should imbibe. As a woman in our church at town campus, she said every time she makes money and she, she they pay her, that is a fraction of that money that she will take to the market, buy tissue paper, buy soap, and she will carry her three daughters and they will go together to a hospital and they will distribute it. Another month, they will carry those things, go to another hospital and she goes with her children. You know why? See, what I've observed is that a father or mother may be good and generous, but if they don't intentionally teach it, to the younger generation. The younger generation will not follow. Now, what most people think is that because I am doing it, I am living as an example. That is one way of training, but it's not the best way. It is part of the way. So you do by showing first, but you also show others by telling them this is how to do it. They may not even see a reason. So since when we were young, when money comes, when a visitor comes to our house and gives us 500 naira, I remember my father will ask you, what is your type? So we knew the mass since then. So you remove 50 naira. We add the tight envelope. You put it inside. On Sunday, you carry it to church. So they were, they were doing it. We saw them do it. But they also taught us to do it. A generous father can raise a stingy child. If he's not intentional about teaching it. That was why Paul was telling Timothy to teach his congregation that. So this woman will carry her children so they see. And the second thing that we said on Sunday is that you pray to God to direct you on the modality of sharing that your generosity. Where to give, who to give, where to send the resources to. Allow God to lead you. Now, let me show you some other ways to structure your generosity. What I want to just show you today is the directions that your generosity should go. If you don't deliberately plan it, people may emotionally blackmail you into doing it. Somebody may spiritually blackmail you into doing it. And when it is done, not willingly. When it is done, not out of generosity flowing from your heart. And it's because somebody placed the demand and the pressure on you. You may, your disposition may be wrong. Even though the act is right. And that would deny you of the blessing that should come. So what are the directions? that your generosity should go. One, 
you must generously give to the Lord. You must generously give to the Lord and to the cause of his kingdom. Generously give to the Lord and to the cause of his kingdom. I will just be briefly practical to you. So, for instance, you belong to a church and the church announced that they are embarking on a project. The church announced, we want to do this. You don't need to wait for the church to say, how much will you give? How much will you give? How much will you give? No. Just that the need has been made known to you. You go back and pray and believe God concerning this thing they want to do. How much of your blessing that is coming my way, the one that has come my way, should I delegate for that meeting? If you do that, the pastor does not need to come and say prophecy that God did not send him for you to bring that money. Oh, we are going to have a conference. Oh, the church is building. Oh, we are going for an outreach. Oh, we need to go and do this. Once you just hear, the Bible says concerning the first church, people by themselves sold their properties and they brought it to church that to be distributed. The only person that messed up was the person who wanted to do it from a wrong spirit. And Ananias and Sapphira, what did they do? They sold their property. Nobody told them to sell it. They sold it and it is them that made up their mind. They were going to give just half of the money and nobody quarreled with them. But the problem was that when they came to church, they deceived the church and said, this is all the money that we sold it so that they may look good in the eyes of people. And Paul, Peter was mad and said, how would you lie to the Holy Spirit? And the Bible said, the hand of the Lord came and struck them dead right there. The wife came and he died there. They did not die because they were giving. They died because they were deceptive in giving. And this is what Peter said. When the land was yours, it's in your hand. When you sold it, it was yours. It is you that determine what to give. Nobody put pressure on you. I want to admonish you. Don't allow yourself to be pressured to give. So before the pressure come, plan it. I travel for conferences. Some of those conferences, some of them I pay for. Some of them, they are free. And it's organized by a church. And in me, I know this program was put together with money. So before I leave my house, as I am planning my transport fare, I am planning what I am going to give in support of that meeting. Guess what? Some of those meetings, when I go there, they don't even take offerings. But me, I've already planned what I am going to give. So I am the one that will even make the move to go and ask. If we want to give, how do we give? If you give us account number, they will not even post it. But it is in me to know if spiritual things are ministered to me. I'm supposed to minister what? Material things in response. So that's why the Bible says, on a, before Sunday, plan what you are going to give. So a pastor does not need to cajole you to give during service. You just know, according to the word of God, you can't go to the house of God empty-handed. So you have structured in your mind, what am I going to give in this worship service? Because your giving is part of your worship. It is planned beforehand. Oh, we are going for a crusade. You should know there must be something that I must part with. They are going for a program. There must be something that I must part with. So you must be generous in your giving to the Lord. In the support of kingdom advancement. In the support of his ministers. In the support of the work. You can't be in a church. You come to church. You hear the word. You are blessed. And there is nothing in you that is parting with certain material things to that church where you belong to the local it is the, nobody these are things you must know so let us assume that in this church we decide to shut down and not take offering for the next three months will you still give if you will not give because we did not create a time for offering you are not generous you do not understand giving if you have to wait, so we, if, let's even assume that we did not put it as part of service. You should come and meet us and say, ah, I brought this 
for the support of the work in the house of God. I don't know, there was no time for offering. How can I part with this? That is the mind of a generous person. Number two, you must be generous towards your parents. You must know there is part of my resources that must be given to my parents. It doesn't matter whether they like you or not. It doesn't matter whether you like them or not. Just structure it. Just structure it. I told you, I, when I was alone, when I was single, I know how much money I part with every month for my father and my mother. And as I was growing financially, it was growing too. When I got married, it now became me and my wife, my parents-in-law, and we plan it. In fact, as we are receiving alert, that's the first thing we wire. Piam, piam, piam. It has gone. As we collect salary, they collect salary. So they practically know when we are paid. They know. And when it when it changed, we moved it up. We didn't know we are changing it. To, they just saw a new alert. And we saw this. Said, that's, that's a new game. And as God blesses us the more, it is structured. They know it. They see it coming. They are expecting it. They know it's going to come. We are going to enter the week now. They know it's going to come. It's part of their budget. They have added it to their income. Struck. They didn't need to come here and say, ah, ah, you, ah, you, you suck this my breast. And I was there so far down here. And you, they don't need to do anything to manipulate me. If we are traveling home, my wife will work everything to just make sure even if it is a dress we give. And you know, because my wife is a tailor and she sews for women, she probably sews for my mom and her mom. And our fathers will be looking. So one day my father said, now wow, five clothes for my mother. So I now made up my mind. What my wife is, I will just go and buy fabric. And her daddy said, this is your own. Go and give your tailor. Planned, structured, there have taught me that some things my father taught me, which is the number one. You don't go to the house of an elderly person empty handed. So if the person does not, when you visit the person, the person doesn't need to be looking and say, if you see something, give me, then you now become generous. No. On your way there, cucumber, bread, a three cups of rice, you saw something, buy. You are going to the house of an elderly person. You are going to go and visit somebody that is sick in the hospital. Y'all went there. The food they even brought for the person you follow, job. Who is you? The other day we had one of our members at the, uh, at the health center there. He had a surgery, so I couldn't make it to visit him. And I called the welfare people. I said, "Please go visit him." And I told them, "Don't go there empty-handed. Even if if it is orange and banana, vitamin C, apple, just buy." And present, oh, how are you doing? Hope you are fine. I brought this. Even if it is donut and rice, don't, you can't go and visit somebody in the hospital empty handed. You can't go and visit somebody in the prison empty handed. You can't go to the house of a minister of God empty handed. You, those things should be known in you. And it doesn't have to be the one that will cut your neck, it is just in you, so you plan it. I remember I, I visited one of our fathers and the way I walked and maneuvered myself to that house, I couldn't stop by to buy. So I told him, Daddy, I just said I'm going to see you today. But I was supposed to buy veggies and fruit for you. I'm coming back and I'll bring it. I even took up. And I got that the man was giving me donut and ah, okay, back. keep your food. Don't. I'm supposed to bring something. I told the man, I beg, sorry. Yo. He has money. Yo. All the children are abroad. He has money. He has money more than me times. How many times? But no, he does not care. It does not matter. Is an elderly person. When I visit him, I don't visit empty handed. Structure it. Give to your parents. Give to those who are in need. Especially those of the household of faith. The Bible categorizes them as poor. And he put these three categories of people under those who are poor. Number one, widows. Whose husband had died. And because in those days, husband does much of the bringing the resources. Number two, he talked about aged people, which I just talked about. And number three, he talks about incapacitated people. Those are poor people. They don't have what it takes to work. The guy just lost his job. The guy is sick. He has not been able to work. The guy's business was burnt. Something happened that has incapacitated the person, that have put the person in a situation that they cannot 
fend for themselves enough. They cannot. These are poor people and you should have something somewhere in your resources that is dedicated to those people. I told my wife before, after I got my I said, you see, these people that are living in our neighborhood, one of the problems I had with them, they are poor people, but I picked two of them and I must not see you around between eight and two. You must be in school. So sometimes, uh, why are you not in school today? They told us to bring 1,000 naira, and my mother does not have. I said, okay, no worry. I go to my house. I said, just go. I said, I know that if they go to school, somewhere in their life, something will be better. So the matter, I said, go to school. Uh, they said, we should bring three exercise books. And my mother does not have money. I said, wait. I will go and buy. Sometimes if you give them money, they chop it. So I go and buy the exercise book. Give. Just go to that school. To the point that if I'm passing by their house, and one of them is going to abscond from school that day. As they see me, they dash off into their room. Me too, I don't mind. I will still call them. Help me call Joe. Call him for me. Why are you not in school? Just with the little that I have. These people to reach out to them. Let's say, ah, their parents, I will mind give it to seven children. They have born them already. If you can't take care of the man, at least pick one or two of those children. It's not their fault that they born them. It's not their fault. Maybe the father is irresponsible, but the children are not their fault. That's how they would just give back to people like rabbits and rats. Yeah, we know. Sorry, auntie. But help the rabbit. Help the rats. They should not die. At least they met you. Give to those who preach and teach the word. And this is what the Bible said about this giving. Give anonymously. Anything you are tempted to make noise about what you give. You are not generous. The world must know that you are the one that bought the mic that pastor is using to preach. Oh God, keep it. Matthew chapter 6 verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. To be seen by them. Otherwise, you have already received your reward from your father who is in heaven. Two. Two, 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 two. Therefore, when you do charitable deeds, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the street that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say unto you, they have already collected. See, that applause that you collected from people is your reward. Is that what you want? Next. But when you do charitable deeds, do not even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yes. That your charitable deeds may be where? In secret. Secret. Ah, praise God. On behalf of myself and my family. All the money that you need for that crusade, we give it. They will bah, 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 do the 20 million naira. God said, Take one, the applause or my reward. Pick one. You can't have the two. You can't what? You can't have the two. So that the God who sees in secret will reward you out openly. Reward you openly. You must give willingly and cheerfully. Second Corinthians from chapter 9 from verse 6 to 7. Give it willingly and cheerfully. Cheerfully. You must re- look at what Solomon, after Solomon had parted with that money, he said, Lord, I still thank you that you gave me the opportunity to give. Lord, I thank you that you helped me to be part of what they were doing in that place. It should not be grudgingly. It must be done cheerfully. Giving must be sacrificial. Especially, listen to me, when it has to do with giving unto the Lord or towards his kingdom advancement, it must be done how? Sacrificially. David said, David wanted to get a piece of land to offer sacrifice as and to build an altar there. The owner of the land said, take it for free. Take it for free. You know what David said? David said, no, I cannot give God what will not cost me something. I cannot give God what will not pain me. 
it must cost me something. Give sacrificially. Give with the spirit of love. I repeat again. Your giving must fulfill these three requirements. It must be out of love. It must speak of honor. And it must be done in obedience. One, it must be what? It must give out of what? Love. Number two, it must speak of what? Honor. And number three, it must be done in obedience. Whatever he says you should do, that is what you should do what? You should do. Stand to your feet. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for speaking to us concerning this issue of generosity. There is a lot ahead that you are positioning us for. Father, the grace to obey you, the grace to do so out of love, and the grace to do so in honor to you, give to us in the name of Jesus, that the blessing of generosity may abound in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed.